let me uh, okay seems to work <laughs> uh, I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about a number of early models of uh, adaptive therapy and then discuss what is the current state you know uh, of the ecology of adaptive therapy modeling uh, you know who's, who's, who's studying that and uh, discuss a number of possible future directions so adaptive therapy if you go back to uh, uh, Bob's uh, 2009 paper is a, a really you know it's a really wide spectrum you know in particular there could be a uh, a number of uh, um, drugs, that, you know, there could be a lot of things that, that you could uh, think about. And I will focus here on uh, so-called containment treatments, uh, by which I mean that you're trying to uh, contain, stabilize tumor size instead of uh, eradic eradicating the tumor. So uh, you could have a, a continuous uh, adaptive therapy or continuous containment, which means that you're trying to stabilize tumor at uh, precisely at a given size, or you could have this intermittent uh, adaptive therapy or intermittent containment that Bob just uh, uh, mentioned, where you stabilize tumor size between two thresholds through, through some uh, on-off uh, treatment cycle. And we want to compare these two to uh, maximal uh, tolerated dose and possibly to also other uh, treatment. So I'll focus here on a very simple model with typically sensitive and resistant tumor cells, but no normal cells, no immune system, no, no, um, no more realism and uh, just a single drug. Okay, let me try to understand why. Yeah, okay. So actually, even though uh, adaptive therapy was relaunched in uh, 2009 by, by Bob Gattenby and, and Curtis, uh, Jan, a few years, Jan, yes? We don't seem to be seeing your slides move. We just currently see your title slide. Is that the way it's meant to be right oh, now? Oh dear me, no, that's not how it's meant to be. So. Uh, so let me try, let me try to understand what- Try sharing on. your entire screen as opposed to just that, um, yeah, that moved whatever you did there. What try do you going. see now? We can see it, but go back one just to see if it moves. Yep, it moves. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. So sorry. So uh, so the pioneer is actually, uh, as far as I know, of, of uh, thinking about, you know, competition between sensitive and resistant cells and, and uh, or to uh, increase your survival times through that, are Rory Martin, uh, Cochlea Theo, uh, Rod Michin, and uh, Mike Fisher, who have two papers in uh, the same uh, uh, issue of mathematical biosci biosciences in, in 92, as well as a book by Martin and Theo in uh, 93, 94. Uh, and in the first paper, they have a model with two types of tumor cells, sensitive and resistant, and they're not by N, the total uh, tumor cell population. Um, and the dynamics of the resistance cell is uh, so that R dot is a G of N R plus uh, times R plus mu S, where G of N is a, a density dependent term, which is decreasing in N, and mu is a mutation term, mutation from sensitive to resistance cells. Uh, and the goal they have is to maximize survival time, which is modeled as the time at which tumor size gets higher than some critical level. And they make a, a simplifying assumption, which of course is not realistic, they assume that uh, the population of sensitive cells is perfectly tunable uh, through treatment. And so the goal then becomes to choose this population of sensitive cells in order to minimize the development of resistance cells. And here there's a trade-off because if you choose S large, this is going to maximize competition. So mathematically, this is going to decrease the term G of N, but it's also going to maximize mutation from sensitive to resistance cells. So it is going to maximize the term mu S. Uh, and then the idea is that if air is small enough, say smaller than some threshold R, R bar, then it means that the mutation term is important in R plus mu S. And so what is most important is to minimize mutation and then so to choose a, a small sensitive population. And uh, if there are a lot of resistance cells, or I mean, maybe not really a lot, but like, at, like more than a certain threshold, then the mutation term in R plus mu S is not so important. And so what becomes essential is to decrease G of N, that is to maximize competition by having a large sensitive population. Um, then they apply these ideas uh, with simulation of three special cases. One is exponential growth. So G of N here is not actually decreasing, it's a constant. And uh, they find that due to the mutation effect, MTD is slightly better than containment or, or adaptive therapy, as we would say now. Um, for the uh, logistic uh, growth rate, um, they find that MTD and containment are roughly comparable, but for uh, a comparison growth rate, they find that containment is much better. So what they conclude 
is that this seemed to be, uh, according to the model, little to lose in using uh, containment instead of MTD, but potentially much to gain uh, due to the compared case. Um, so the paper is hard to read for, for maybe most of us, but uh, happily, Eza Ensen and Cortes wrote uh, a much more pedagogical treatment of uh, this issue focusing on the logistic case, and they also add various types of uh, resistance cost. Um, they show that the effect of various types of resistance cost is not the same. So you have, you know, and I think that's a, an interesting point. And they also uh, state explicitly that resistance costs are not needed for uh, containment to improve on um, MTD as evidenced by uh, the paper uh, that I just talked about before. Uh, or to pens on this with the Rob Noble is that actually you can compute from the model the initial resistance population and you can quantify the impact of uh, ongoing mutations. And you can show that taking into account in the model mutations that appear uh, after treatment initiation has actually a very small effect. So to simplify, it might be reasonable to uh, not to consider that. Um, historically, the second model I know is due to Ellen Monroe and Iman Gaffney in 2009, just before the adaptive therapy paper. Um, they do simulation of a comparison model with a Norton Simon key rate. So you have two uh, population again, sensitive and resistant. Um, and you see there is no cost of resistance e either. Um, it's the same row, uh, same growth rate row for, for both. Um, and you have an effect of treatment, which depends on the sensitivity lambda of the sensitive cells. Uh, and you also have a mutation from sensitive to resistant cells, but they don't play a very important role in this model. Um, the uh, K is a carrying capacity that is a maximal population uh, tumor size that, that would be achievable uh, with a treatment you know, in, in the long run. So C is a dose, mu is a mutation term, and L lambda is a sensitiv sensitivity, as I already said. And um, the question they ask is, uh, first, what is the best constant dose? So they focus, they focus on constant dose. And secondary, what is the best treatment starting time? At what, what they find in the simulation is that what's best is to have a moderate dose and to delay somewhat the treatment. This is what is going to increase survival time. The intuition is that if you have a very high dose, you're gonna kill sensitive cells and you're gonna die mostly from the resistant cells. If you have a very low dose, you're gonna die from the sensitive cells. Uh, so the idea is that you should strike a balance between these two things and the optimal dose is such that when you die, uh, you have almost uh, as many resistance and sensitive, sensitive cells in their model. And moreover, the idea of delaying treatment is because by increasing N, then uh, you're decreasing the term uh, log of K over N. And so it's like you're increasing competition. Next comes uh, the, the paper by Bob in, uh, and, and Cotters in 2009 that coined the word adaptive therapy and that has a different spirit. For instance, this is the first time that we talk about cost of resistance. And this is also the first paper with preclinical data. The paper contains two models. So one which is quite mysterious and uh, you know, happy to talk about that with anybody, but, but most of us you know, don't really get it. Uh, but there's another model which is much easier to understand for the simulation is the first frequency dependent model I know in this literature. And this is similar to, this is a discrete time model, but in continuous time it would be roughly as I wrote, uh, the, growth, uh, the per capita growth rate of uh, type I, the various type, per capita growth rate of type I is equal to uh, uh, factor rho times a ratio WI of a W bar, where WI is some kind of fitness parameter, a W bar is the average fitness parameter in the population, minus uh, uh, some death term, which depends on the sensitivity, sensitivity of type I on uh, the dose C and uh, parameter E, uh, which is the environmental sensitivity. Um, to try to model, you know, things like hypoxia or, or you know, things like that. And there is a dynamic for this uh, environmental sensitivity, which I will not show here. So uh, Bob does a simulation with five types, uh, fittest but most sensitive, less fit and sensitive, less fit and resistant, one which is called environmentally resistant and one which is, one which is both fit and resistant. And he finds that, you know, if the fit and resistant type dominates, there is little to do, but otherwise, uh, at will substantially improve on MTD. Um, the next generation of model in that spirit uh, is due to uh, Silva et al. And there is a, a, a Bob again on this paper. And again, this is a discrete time uh, frequency dependent model, but in continuous time, it could be written a little bit like I, I, I wrote here. 
uh, the per capita growth rate of sensitive cell will be uh, equal to some uh, growth rate whole S, which depends, is affected by some auxiliary treatment, treatment uh, multiplied by the frequency of resistance cell and minus the death term. Um, so uh, if at the beginning there are very uh, few resistance cell, this is roughly rho S minus lambda S times C. Uh, and same thing for the resistance cell, except that uh, they are less affected by treatment uh, and that uh, you know, the, 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 the term uh, of the frequency dependence is also their frequency, but it means that when they are rare, this term is almost zero. So here, uh, as before, the lambda sensitivity is to treatment and the O are uh, growth rates. But uh, as I said, the innovation here is that these growth rates are affected by some auxiliary treatment. So the idea is that uh, there could be ways to uh, increase the resistance cost in order to improve adaptive therapy. I think this is the point of this model and this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, well explained. Uh, however, some of us felt that um, the basic model uh, the form of frequency dependence was too favorable to adaptive therapy, contra contrary, I should say, to Bob's uh, initial model in 2009, uh, because you see, if R is very small, the relative fitness of resistance cell, uh, uh, you know, uh, is really small as well. So, uh, uh, Basevich, uh, 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 Noble, and uh, Cotters in 2017 decided to study a similar model, but replacing the uh, density, the frequency dependence uh, uh, expression R divided by uh, S per plus R by some function of R, which is non zero uh, when uh, R is equal to zero. So, uh, the relative fitness of resistance when rare does not approach zero. And they find that the key parameter to estimate the, uh, ad the gain of uh, adaptive therapy over uh, uh, MTD is this relative fitness F0 when resistance cells are rare. Uh, another influential model that you know, Bob already presented is a model in Zhang et al. that has been developed uh, further by Jessica Cunningham and Curtis. Uh, so it's a, a log Cavalter model with two sensitive and one fully resistant type. Um, and it has two things that are actually I mean, a number of things that are a little bit special. So first, there are three types and not two, so it's a little bit more complicated. Second thing is that uh, there is not only competition between the sensitive types, one of the type helps the other, which, which is not crucial uh, you know, in the model, but uh, uh, you know, is, is, is something that is a little bit different from most other models I know. Uh, and uh, also, the, uh, so, so I think it's not crucial, uh, the effect of treatment is not a standard death term, uh, it appears in the carrying capacity. So uh, here, so n i is number is a cell of uh, represents the number of density of cells of, of type i carrying carrying capacity of a uh, of a uh, uh, type i and alpha i j is a competition coefficient that tells how much uh, type i will influence type j. Uh, whether is, whether there is a cost of resistance is quite debatable. I would say no, and that's the reason why uh, the reason why is because the alpha i j are less than one. So there is not a strong competition between sensitive and resistant in that sense. And what the others do, as, as we saw, is to compare uh, intermittent adaptive therapy to MTD and, and, and also metronomic uh, therapy via simulations. And this is quite a famous uh, uh, model in influential, uh, in part because it is in a paper, in the paper that reported the, the results of first uh, uh, clinical trial. Um, but uh, because it's been uh, famous and influential, I'd like to, to explain that According to me, other models would have generated quite similar motivation for the trial. Uh, moreover, uh, it's somewhat complex uh, because there are three types. Oh, sorry, I don't want to do that. Uh, because of the effects of treatment, uh, because there is this uh, cycling uh, behavior. And it's also somewhat imprecise because it's not clear when you read the model whether Ni is a density or the total number of uh, uh, cells of type I, and actually, I, I think actually it, it, it is uh, an important uh, uh, thing to, to make clear. So this, a little, this led to some confusion, and this is an interesting model, but so I think it should not become the model, it should, be, it should be just one model among many other models that, that are interesting. Um, talking about other models, there are other lot of other models in, in, in the literature. So for instance, Cecil Carrer uh, as a model with two types, uh, which is quite similar to uh, Zangatol, except that th there is a standard treatment impact. And also uh, the uh, competition coefficient alpha here uh, is potentially large. Uh, it is great, greater than one. So there is definitely uh, some kind of cost of resistance. Uh, and moreover, it might be very large. So uh, it, it may be envisioned in this model 
to have indefinite containment. So not a cure, but you stabilize the, the, the tumor for a very, very, very long time. Moreover, the approach is not simulation, but more, you know, hardcore optimal control. Uh, even more hardcore optimal control is Carrier and Zidani, who uh, add uncertainty of the parameters of Carrier's model, and also add the interesting idea that we should try to stabilize some uh, maximal acceptable uh, tumor size, which is something that Rob and I also have been thinking about. Uh, uh, an also very involved model is due to Pushol and, and collaborators, including Jean-Claire Rambeau, where there is an infinite number of types, uh, birth deaths, and there are two types of drugs, and maybe Jean will talk about that uh, in a few days, I don't know. Um, and and uh, last but not least, there is a recent paper by uh, Strobel et al., and I'm one of the et al., uh, where there is a birth death model and that studies the uh, effect of uh, cell turnover on uh, the importance, uh, on the effect of the cost of resistance, and on uh, the, uh, the comparison between adaptive therapy and MTD. Uh, something that uh, is also important in this model is to think about space. So as far as I know, but I might be wrong, there is no partial differential equation model like reaction diffusion, which is uh, uh, from a theoretical point of view, not from agent-based uh, uh, simulation, huh? that is applied to adaptive therapy. Uh, but however, there is a number of models that have been thinking about space. So there is one in, in uh, Basevich and uh, Noble et al. There's one in uh, Gala et al. And there's also uh, Lee et al. in, in uh, uh, the Maastricht sphere. Um, and there are various reasons why uh, space may be important as some of these uh, papers exemplify. Uh, first one is that the idea of boundary growth of the tumor uh, may justify the assumption of competition, may, might be one way of modeling competition. Um, another way, another important thing is that if there is some special separation between the cell types, between resistance and sensitive, sensitive cells, there might be uh, low competition between these types compared to well-mixed uh, system. Uh, another thing that is important in the Galileo et al. paper is that if resistance cells become trapped in the tumor core, maybe because they are less motile or whatever, uh, the, then this may increase the impact of resistance cells because not only the, the resistance cells are less fit, but they also find themselves in the wrong place. And due to all these reasons and potentially more, uh, simulations show that taking space into account will impact the comparison between continuous adaptive therapy, intermittent adaptive therapy, and MTD. And we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, just to say that there are other models, including evolutionary games, including more optimal control model, leader for games, as Bob has mentioned, and, and probably models I just don't know. Uh, but that's all for models now. I uh, want to say about, a bit about the current ecology of uh, adaptive therapy modeling. So I would say that we are still pretty much in Moffitt's gravity field. If I include Moffitt's metastasis, I mean people who have been in Moffitt uh, and are no longer there, uh, but the field is expanding and there are different styles. So uh, some people are doing mostly simulations, some people are doing rather, you know, optimal control, sometimes quite tough to understand for the people, so there's evolutionary game theory. There are people like me, or I would say also as maybe uh, Elsa Hansen, who are trying to uh, use simple mathematics for to explain simple things with some pedagogical purposes. And, and, you know, also people that I don't know very well, and so I'm not sure what to do, but I'm sure they do lots of interesting and complementary things. So, uh, because, you know, the field is still uh, pretty much centered on Moffitt, it is important to hear non-Moffitt voices. And that's why we invited many people who are not from Moffitt in this workshop. But it's also, because the field is expanding, important to build a community, and that was another motivation for this workshop. Uh, if I could send some uh, messages to different categories of people, I would say to people doing simulation that theoreticians sometimes may really help to make sense of your results and explain why they could have predicted what you see in your simulations and, you know, maybe tell you and then you should do, do also this and this simulation. To people doing hardcore optimal control or strong math, you know, please consider that uh, some of your papers are unreadable by most of us. So, so try to you know, translate and be gentle and maybe write something pedagogical so that we can follow. Um, let me also note that, you know, when you're doing optimal control and I teach optimal control, you know, you want to find the optimal treatment. Okay, and that's a natural goal. However, uh, sometimes this is not the best thing to do because it's already interesting to compare containment and MTD. And if you just do this simple thing, which is much simpler mathematically, and you can also do just simulation, for instance then it is much easier to vary a lot of the assumptions to stress test the conclusion of your model. 
And finally, to people like me who are afraid of computers and try to avoid simulation, you know, I've learned during in this journey that that you know I was wrong, and you know, with a better article mind, and I'm not saying I have that, but uh, you 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 cannot foresee everything, and you have to do this simulation to to understand a little bit how your model is doing. I'll finish if I have some time, but otherwise, Sandy, uh, you can cut me uh, by discussing what could make our better our model is better. So I think first that we should put all our ability abilities together and that's why we try to build a community. We also need more data. So it was fascinating to see Bob show some data. Uh, I would love to, to have all this uh, data from Zang et al or any data that is uh, around uh, publicly available so that we can, you know, think about it. Um, also think that we should uh, be precise. As I already said, you know, in density dependent model, it's not always clear whether our variables are densities or total population sizes. It might be crucial. If only because it's not the same thing you should observe to uh, to uh, uh, decide what the treatment should be, and also because uh, if uh, you it's uh, total population sizes, typically this means that competition kicks in very late in the history of the cancer. Why, if these are densities, then it means that there is competition also when tumor size is relatively small. Uh, so space uh, should we develop PDD models? That at least should be you know a question that we that we ask ourselves. Um, something also that is very important is to explore trade-offs between the benefits of, the, of adaptive therapy and potential downside. So you see, one of the issues is that initially we had to convince people that adaptive therapy was interesting. We had to tell them why adaptive therapy could work. So in our model, we put everything that was more or less in favor of adaptive therapy. Now we have to step back and say, okay, we explain that. And now let's stress test our conclusion put things that are against adaptive therapy and see if adaptive therapy is still working in this more complex model. So one of these things, for instance, is that the way I and other people have been modeling survival time is probably wrong. Uh, it's, it's, you know, um, it's saying that, you know, you, you go to a certain size and then you die. You know, I don't think doctors would say that. Uh, the higher the tumor burden, you know, the more likely it is that something will go wrong, as uh, uh, discussed by uh, Itesh Mistry recently. And, and I think we should try to, to use this in our models. Uh, I also think that in models that, are, that have sensitive and fully resistant cells uh, and no partially resistant cells, uh, this is too easy for adaptive therapy. You see, because when you have partially resistant cells, there are two ways of fighting them. One is via competition through adaptive therapy. Uh, and the other one is via MTD because partially resistant cells are still somewhat sensitive. And so MTD will have an effect on them. And that's why it's not clear in that situation that adaptive therapy would be superior to MTD. So uh, I think we should have this kind of cell and uh, we should also, also have more than two sensitivity levels. Uh, for instance, you could have a, a first type of sensitive cell that mutates in some uh, other type of sensitive cell that eventually mutates in some uh, even more resistant type as some people started to do uh, and re uh, reinvestigate the trade-off between mutations from sensitive to resistance and competition uh, in this uh, more complicated model. Also other kind of mutation like driver mutation, making the tumor more aggressive, uh, pheno, pho, you know, phenotypic changes that are not, uh, that are epigenetic uh, and not uh, genetic. Um, in particular, the phenomenon of uh, drug-induced resistance, um, which we will talk about in a few days. Uh, Multidrug adaptive therapy, we also have a, a session on that. And, uh, uh, of course, uh, we may wonder, wonder at some point, uh, you know, if we should not also think about including more realism, like normal cells or the human system, etc. Finally, as long as uh, we don't have uh, clear clinical results on other types of uh, cancer than prostate cancer, we should uh, keep wondering whether there are some specificities in prostate cancer that explain why the first clinical trial was successful and why other trials might be less successful. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. And I'd like to thank, to thank also uh, Katarina Stankova, Joel Brown, Jessica Cunningham, Rob Noble, Jeffrey West, and many others, including Sandy, Bob, etc., for helping me to, you know, putting a foot in, in, in this great field. Thank you. Thank you, Yannick. That was very nice. Um, some of that work I, I wasn't actually aware of and, and some of it I was, so it's very nice to put it all in context. Anyway, we do actually have a couple of questions for you. So um, Heiko kicks us off. 
and he's asking um, in the SR model, which I guess since recent has the three has three special cases: exponential, entity slightly better, Gomperts containment much better. Is the benefit of containment in the Gomperts due to the super exponential growth at very low v over k, or rather the very slow growth at higher v over k? Okay, so I'm, I'm not sure I can precisely answer the question, but, but I will give you my, my, my explanation of this. Um, I don't know if I can go back to that or not. Uh, so in this model, um, what happened is that uh, N is the total population size. Uh, and if you assume that A is, uh, uh, so, so, you know, the time at which you die is substantially smaller than uh, the carrying capacity, you know, say, say for instance that N over K is like one person. Uh, it means that uh, the competition effect is very small. End of a K will, before you die, will never be more than one person. And so, uh, you know, rho times one minus end of a K will be at least 99% of rho, which is the maximal speed at which, uh, you know, the tumor resistance are going to, to progress. So there is almost uh, no effect of competition. And that's why MTD and containment are comparable. Why, if you look at Gompers, and we have analyzed that much more with uh, with Rob, uh, 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 and maybe Rob will talk about that, I don't know. Uh, you have uh, an effect of competition uh, that is important even when uh, uh, N is much smaller than K. Um, and uh, yeah, now I remember I saw, uh, there will be a slide about this in, in, in Rob's presentation in, uh, uh, in two days. Okay, um, Katerina asks, are you learning some numerics? Well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm learning, but very, very slowly. And, and, you know, I rely on Rob a lot. Fair enough. And then we have um, Vahide Vakil asks, there was a slide with a model representing different carrying capacities for different sensors and cell resistant types. How can you explain that? Can you, can you repeat? Basically saying, how can you have different carrying capacities for sensitive and resistant cell types in comparison with, say, some sort of shared carrying capacity? Why would oh, it well, well, no, I mean, uh, you know, you could imagine that, for instance, uh, 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 resistant cells uh, are, are less fit. And so if there were only resistant cells, the total, uh, um, uh, the maximal density of the tumor would be lower than if you had only sensitive cells, right? Uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't mean that it's not shared in the model. It is, it is a, well, I mean, somewhat shared is that in, if you, let me try to, uh, to go there. Uh, uh, you see, for instance, if you look at the Zegatol model, so KI did not be the, did not be the same for, for, for everybody, but, but, you know, there is still interaction because uh, you have to sum of the uh, uh, NJ, which is uh, in, the, in the numerator. Um, but I mean, I think it, it could be realistic that uh, if, then C is higher than something, than some threshold, then there is not enough resources or there are some problems. That means that a certain type does not manage to, to develop and this threshold need not be the same for uh, all uh, uh, tumor cells. Okay. And then we have uh, from Jessica, uh, I love the idea of levels of resistance. Resistance more as a continuous trait, not a yes, no. Is there models that explore this yet? Is there experimental data that shows that resistance is continuous or are individual cells on and off, but the population as a whole acts as a continuous trait? So uh, I'm not an experimentalist. So uh, I think other people can answer better on, on, on that side. Uh, for models, so I've been trying to investigate this thing, uh, but there are also models that, that are out there. So for instance, in, in Pushol et al, uh, there is an infinite, infinite number of types. Uh, but this model is not known because it's, I mean, except the introduction, it's more, almost unreadable by most of the people who are attending this workshop, including myself. I mean, it's hard for me to, to uh, you know, to, to follow it precisely. So, uh, yes, there are some models, uh, but there should be more. Actually, this is on my to-do list for starting in January. So if some people are interested, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to join forces with them to, to explore these models with more types. And I have some pre preliminary results, but it's, it's, you know, it's still pre preliminary. And I will say that Jill Gallagher's cancer research paper has um, resistance as a continuous trait. True, true. That's true. That's true. That's a great paper. I love it, actually. And then um, from Audrey, 
Uh, Yannick, do you think there are any game theory approaches that aren't considered yet that might be useful for understanding of adaptive therapy? Okay, so I feel guilty because my field, you know, is evolutionary game theory. It's not cancer, right? Yes. Uh, it, it's, it's really my field and where I'm recognized. And I haven't taken the time of really reading this evolutionary game theory paper because I've been absorbed by, you know, learning cancer things, etc. So, but, uh, um, so I'm, I'm not sure, but if you have some game theoretical ID, uh, know that this is my field, okay? My, my PhD is in game theory, it's not in cancer, not in man mathematical oncology, uh, and it's in evolutionary game theory. Uh, and I'm well connected to the evolutionary game theorists. So uh, don't hesitate to send me your ideas and to discuss them with me. I don't have to be a cutter. I'm just happy to discuss that with you. Great. And then from John, John Metzgar, um, are these slides going to be made available as a review in the literature or does the speaker have a publicly available written review available? Will this oh. become a review? So uh, there are two things. For first, in, in, in a preprint with, uh, uh, that is uh, no actually, should, well, it's more or less accepted in uh, Nature, Ecology, and Evolution with Rob. We have a, a large supplementary material, and the first chapter is this review, okay? Uh, I mean, part of it. Um, but actually, I plan to send uh, to, uh, to, to all the participants that are interested uh, an extended version of this, where uh, you know, I look at all these models, and I explain a little bit more about it, so maybe one page per model, um, and uh, uh, that I would be uh, happy to, sh to, to share with uh, all of you. And then um, Joel uh, asks, great, great talk, Yann. Do we need to, uh, to catalog and explore how therapies impact growth and how and where the cost of resistance enters the true biology and the models? I don't hear you very well. So uh, can ah. I see actually, can I read this question? I, if I'm, you look I'm at the Q&A, can, can you see the Q&A? Yeah, but I'm, I'm clicking like crazy. And so maybe I should stay. Okay, let, my let me just repeat it to you and I'll yeah. speak a bit louder. No, no, yeah. Do you think we need to catalog and explore how therapies impact growth and how and where the cost of resistance enters the true biology and the models? So, well, I mean, that's my tendency, right? I'm a, man, I'm a mathematician, I'm a theoretician. So I like to make catalogs and to try to explain you know, to do very simple models and, and very, like I said, you know, if, if like, uh, N is the density, if it's in total, uh, you know, uh, total uh, population size, uh, what does it change, etc. I'm trying to build a simple theory with simple models, but not something where you do a lot of similarity, etc. but you can improve really things and understand, you know, simple models deeply. Uh, and um, uh, so, uh, you know, because this is, you know, my, my uh, added value to this, uh, to this field. Um, so, uh, uh, so yes, I think I think that uh, this uh, this would be useful, and, and that what that what I will try to contribute. Yeah. It's okay. Kind of, uh, and then final comment from Katarina: coordination games! Exclamation mark. Yeah. Well. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what was the comment. Uh, well, I guess that was in I'm, relation I'm, to I'm, other I'm, game theory approaches that could be used. You know, the, my problem is that as a game theorist. You know, I, I, as soon as somebody is using game theory, my tendency is this guy is not using game theory as he should, right? You know, I'm very critical of that because I, I, I you know, I see everything that's in the paper is not as I, as we, we thought in game theory, you know? So, so, but, uh, but certainly I'm happy to explore these things. Coordination again might be important if you see, for instance, that, you know, there is a, a cooperation between different uh, tumor types as uh, uh, in the Zengental model. So, so why not? Um, but, but I have no special idea right now on, on, uh, on this thing. Great. Okay, well, thanks, Yannick. Um, it's been a great discussion, and um, we now have a break.